Hello. Hope I'm audible. Yes. yes. Thank you, ma'am, for joining. Good chat. Abhi, Ah, yes, miss. Uh, yeah, let's start. Participants who are there in the session, uh, some instructions are being given. So, participants participants are expected to join the meeting ten minutes before the commencement of the program. And you can use the QA sessions in the chat, uh, questions uh, to the specific to the topic spoken. And uh, the feedback link will be given in the uh, chat box. And you can to fill the forms every day. Participants are requested not to introduce themselves in the chat box. Participants should mute their audio and turn off their camera. Those who failed in doing so will be removed from the meet. Feedback links will be shared only after the session and it will not be posted in the WhatsApp group. Certificates will be provided for the participants who have attended at least the two days. So I'm going to begin. Barbara Johnson Cotter, teaching literature is a teaching how to read, how to notice things in a text that was speed reading culture is trained to disregard, overcome, edit out or explain away. How to read what language is doing, not guess what the author was thinking. How to make from a page, not seek reality to substitute for it. Respected principal, honorable resource person, accuracy coordinator, HOD, teachers, and my dear friends, a warm good morning to one and all. Today, PG Department of English in collaboration with Alcuesi of MES KVM College Volunteri is conducting a three day faculty development program on teaching language and literature under the UGC Parama screen. So I invite you all to a wonderful session. Now I invite Ma'am, the Assistant Professor of English, to render the Ma'am, please. Good morning, all. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, honorable session for waiting eagerly. I know everybody is waiting eagerly for uh, the talk by Armira, ma'am. She's such a wonderful person. But let me grab just two minutes of your valuable time. I would like to introduce our uh, HOD and IPS coordinator, Dr. Najla T.Y. And I would like to welcome ma'am to the session. And I'm really grateful that uh, there was such a person to guide and lead us. And she has really uh, shown the uh, actual leadership quality. She was always asking what I have done and how well I have reached and all that. And I would also like to introduce and uh, welcome our uh, principal, Dr. C. Rajesh. And uh, the best quality of our principal is that he always looks into what sort of program that we are conducting and always has the opportunity to guide us and give suggestions as to what we have to do. So welcome you, sir. Then I would like to welcome our resource person of the day, uh, the Nila ma'am. And I'm really grateful that she did accept my request in the first hand itself. And uh, we are very grateful for having you to have a speech in cultural studies. And I cannot forget to welcome our dear audience without whose presence this thing would not have been successful. And I would also like to welcome Abhirami, the, uh, what shall I say, the anchor of the day. And I would also like to welcome uh, Ashwari ma'am and uh, all my colleagues for this program. Thank you. And I would also like to welcome our HOD for the presidential address. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Respected principal, Dr. Rajesha, <coughs> esteemed chief guest, resource person of the day, Dr. Nila, ma'am, faculty joining us from all over, not just in India, actually, even from abroad, faculty from our department and all the other participants. A very good morning to you all. I would like to, at the outset itself, welcome all of you warmly to this three-day FDP program. 
it's been overwhelming to see the kind of response that they have got for this program there are participants from all over like not just india but like uh, pakistan uae and many other countries and it's uh, this has been of course me being made possible by the uh, pandemic situation like what albert einstein has said in every crisis there is an opportunity we know of so much of these kinds of uh, troubles that all of us and uh, all of the students are going through maybe not able to access classes offline and maybe uh, a lot of people outside we know the ground reality of how it is difficult but even amidst that maybe i can just mention uh with the fear of not being too insensitive that we have been able to reap some of the benefits of this situation by holding these sorts of programs online when we are able to access the expertise of such resource persons without having to travel and maybe stay at home and participate in all this and equip ourselves more fully to make use of whatever is left with us to make possible the teaching and learning uh, process in on this online mode and in that line we have planned this 3 day fdp faculty development program under the ugc paramesh scheme so that it benefits all the teachers all the faculty and uh, the, we are able to do our job a bit more effectively at least thank you all for joining us today in the three days uh, that are uh, marked for this faculty development program today we have with us dr nila n from mercy college she'll be talking uh, to us about cultural studies on the second day we have a talk on english language teaching and on the third day we have got a discourse on documentary films and cultural studies films these are new additions so okay maybe film studies have been added a few years ago but cultural studies was just introduced two years ago at the undergraduate level these are all you know, like cultural studies is an interdisciplinary field which maybe the faculty are very familiar with uh, earlier itself but it's something that is new that has been added to the uh, syllabus especially to our functional english syllabus so it's very pertinent that we have these sorts of faculty development programs where uh, people with expertise erudite scholars like dr nila can speak to us about these topics and share with us the kind of experience she has had with teaching these subjects thank you so much ma'am for joining us thank you this program is conducted under ugc and uh, ugc paramesh we are a uh, ugc paramesh mentor college and we have got six mentee colleges under us and this faculty program is especially directed towards skilling the uh, faculty in our uh, college and in the mentee colleges we are so happy to the, that ugc has selected us for this program and it has made uh, us it possible made uh, it possible so that we can conduct programs such as these i thank the ugc for helping us with these sort of funding and hope that we will be sele uh, selected for these sort of endeavors in further also i welcome all of you thank you so much for joining us may i invite our principal dr c rajesh to inaugurate the program our respected chief guest of today uh, dr neela head of the department of uh, english Dr. Najila, coordinators of the program, Professor Sidya and Dr. Rajesh. I think some participants have unmuted their mic. I request all the participants to please keep your mics muted. Can uh, I think MES is oh yeah now it is okay. Now I am very happy that the Department of English is conducting a faculty development program. on i think some of the mics are uh, najla the mic at the center is on i think oh, okay so department is organizing a faculty development program on teaching of language and literature actually this program as professor najla mentioned is being organized under the paramesh scheme of ugc which is a program for mentoring non accredited higher education institutions and we are conducting these kind of pro programs very frequently for the mentor mentee colleges actually in the pandemic period 
there, there was a paradigm shift in the learning and teaching methodologies. The use of literature in the English language teaching is has undergone a revival for a number of reasons. We know. Actually, the traditional language teaching approaches in the traditional language teaching approaches, literature was very popular. But it became less popular when the language teaching and learning started to focus on the functional use of the language, especially uh, in English itself, uh, in our college itself, the BA English is not literature, it is functional English. So the role of literature in the English language teaching classroom has been reassessed and many new, many view that literary texts are providing rich linguistic input, effective stimuli for students to express themselves in other languages and as a potential source of learner motivation. And it helps, the literature helps the learners to practice the language skills. That's the LSRW, speaking, listening, reading and writing. And literature can help learners to develop their understanding of other culture. One of the topic in this FDP is about the cultural studies. I think today uh, Dr. Nivai is hand taking a session on cultural studies. And literature also helps to give awareness of the different difference and to develop tolerance and understanding. At the same time, the literary texts can deal with universal themes such as love, loss, war, etc. and are not always covered in sanitized world of course books. And communicative methodologies stress the importance of using authentic materials and activities in classroom in order to help students achieve communicative competence that will enable them to use the language for communicative purposes in the real world. So, uh, language teaching is one of the integral part of curriculum of every programs or every courses, like any UG, UG programs especially. So, not only the subject, the, the importance of language teaching is given uh, it, it is because of the importance of language teaching that uh, uh, it is given due importance. And uh, I think this faculty development program will enrich the faculty members of our college and the colleges of our Mindy colleges and other colleges. Uh, a lot of participants are here in this faculty development program. I think almost the meeting is full and a lot of people are watching this FDP or they are participating in this FDP and they are watching this session in YouTube. And uh, they, I think, I hope, this FD, through this FDP, they can get awareness about the new trends in language teaching. And uh, I wish all success for the program. And with these few words, I inaugurate the FDP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Sandulj Babusa, the Staff Secretary and HOD of Commerce, to felicitate the session. Sir, please. I think Abhirami, Dr. Santosh has uh, not joined because maybe because he's also busy with another FTP which will be opening soon. Okay, ma'am. Then I will invite the next person. So I invite Habib Rahman, sir, the coordinator of self-financing course to felicitate the session. Sir, please. Good morning, all. Respected uh, chief guest of the day, Dr. Nila. Respected principal, Sri Ajit, sir very vibrant HOD of English department, Dr. Najila, and very uh, sincere teachers of that department. First of all, let me express my sincere thanks for inviting me to deliver a presenting address for the three-day FDU program organized by the Department of English. I think the three topics to be covered within these three days are very important, especially the culture and literature. I like that. As far as the uh, language is concerned, every minute aspect of all the uh, area should be covered in the case of uh, an academic session. So I think in all sense, this department has uh, organized a wonderful program for the academic achievement 
as well as the enrichment of the faculty members of uh, our college. So, I think this uh, program will be a grand success and I wish all the best uh, for the program. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. So, uh, before uh, participants, uh, participants, please mute your mic so a uh, resource person can talk. And uh, if you have any questions to be asked, you can just ask after the session. Dr. Nila N is Assistant Professor of Department of English, Mercy College, Palakkad. She has completed her UG, EG and PhD from Bharatiya University, Coimbatore. She was a university rank holder of that time. Dr. Nila is having a teaching experience of 20 fruitful years. So far, she has published three books and had her articles published in various national and international journals. She was conferred with Malayali Mudra Award for Excellence in Academic Work. She had been invited as a resource person in more than 60 national and international seminar. There is no other eminent personality than her to talk on cultural studies. I invite our honorable chief person, resource person, Dr. Nila Ma'am, to innovate the session with her wonderful words. Ma'am, please. Good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Thank you. At the outset, let me submit my heartfelt gratitude to MES KVM College, Velanjeri, for inviting me to speak on this three day, I should say international workshop, because I heard that many people from outside the country too are participating. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. From the way I saw the principal, the staff members, the self-financing coordinator and everybody talk, I enjoyed the chemistry going on in the college and that is the secret of your college success. So I thank Dr. Sivya Vasudevan who had been in touch with me from the first time. She contacted me for the sake of this workshop the HOD, Dr. Najila T.Y., Principal, Dr. C. Rajesh, Dr. Santosh Babu, Dr. P.M. Habib Rahiman, Student Secretary, Ms. Abhirami Subash, and Dr. Ashwati, who have all joined together to keep the ball rolling for this international workshop. So I thank you all for giving me this wonderful opportunity to meet people from various parts of the world and speak on my favorite subject, cultural studies. So without much delay, I move on to my presentation. I'm sharing my screen. I just want one of you to tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, madam. Thank you. So when we go to the topic called cultural studies, just as the word culture means a variety of lifestyles, it has a variety of subdivisions. You must know that FLU has its own department called cultural studies. English language department is different, cultural studies department is different. Just like film studies started to become a department in universities, cultural studies has crept in in the last two decades. So I am going to speak on cultural appropriation, resistance and resolution. I understand that 90% uh, of today's listeners uh, teaching faculty, maybe a few of you, maybe students. So keeping all of you in mind, I have prepared my talk today in a way that it starts from the scratch and moves up to the maximum I can discuss within one and a half hours under cultural studies. Sticking to my topic, what is culture? That complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, 
and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society, said Edward Tyler. It could also include models, it, it, it can include law, and it can also include habits. The habits that you have may be different from the habits that I follow. So that also can be culture. So everything comes under this canopy called culture. It has multiple meanings. How we dress, how we eat, how we speak, what we think, unstated rules. Rules that relegate everyday practices and activities. Embedded norms. I think you could clearly understand what it means by uh, unstated rules and embedded norms. Now, for example, there will be a few embedded norms in KVM College. That is the culture in that college. There will be a few embedded norms in Mercy College. That will be the culture here. So each family can have its embedded norms. For example, there may be a chair or an easy chair in the hall where only grandpa comes and sits. And children only sneak and sit into it when he is not there. He goes to the bedroom or he is away. They, when, when they see him, they immediately get up because they know there's an embedded norm that that chair is for grandpa. He sits only there. So everything comes under this canopy called culture. Culture is a way of life, a product of humans living together. It can happen because we live together. Includes all the characteristic activities. The culture in Tamil Nadu may be different. The culture in Kerala will be different. The culture in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Europe. It keeps changing from place to place. Interests of people makes culture. Social interactions and relationships make culture. How you talk. Are you a person always present online? Now, because of uh, Corona pandemic, we have forgiven all family members who sit in front of the Android phone. Three years ago, if our spouses or anybody else in the family sat in, fr in front of the phone for too long, it led to divorces. They had family issues. There was disharmony. But now everybody has accepted. You can only stand away from the child and look at your boy or girl who's attending school, praying that she's not browsing on another screen. Nothing more could be done. So we have accepted this social change. So that has become a way of life. Theorizing culture. You have various theories. It's not like post-colonialism or post-modernism. It doesn't stick to just one kind of an essay or one person's essay. It has been theorized by many. So so in structuralism, semiotics, Barth's myths of bourgeois societies and texts. Foucault in history and philosophy that he spoke about, Marx underlining modes of production, even Christopher when speaking about feminism. So it has been touched upon by all theorists. First bit of my talk deals with cultural appropriation. It is the adoption of elements of one culture by members of another culture. Cultural elements which have deep meaning to the original culture may be reduced to exotic fashion or toys by those from a dominant culture. This could be related to a bit of post-colonialism. So you have slowly accepted another culture. It can also be dealt uh, with the culture that is followed by migrants. When you go to another place, the dominant culture tries to seep into you, but then your culture becomes exotic there. Appropriation becomes a byproduct of modern times. Appropriated from the disadvantaged minority because of the presence of power imbalances, a byproduct of colonialism and oppression. The picture on the screen would give you an example of how our dressing style has changed. You may belong to any country. You would have had your own dressing sense or your own culture. Now, I'm an Indian, and today I consider this to be an official dress, the one which I'm wearing today. I consider it official because I'm going online. But that need not be an official dress for somebody else. Now, the example on the slide would be one example of how Indian women themselves have assimilated, have appropriated culture. They have received from some other culture. And now they are comfortable in following it. 
imitation can also lead to cultural appropriation. Kijerson Johnson has written that when this is done, the imitator who does not experience that oppression is able to play temporarily an exotic other. So when you're not oppressed but you imitate, you always become the exotic other, different from others. Of course, you may be uh, attracting some unnecessary attention, but then you're happy about being different. Now, what, what are the negatives we see in cultural appropriation? The term sets arbitrary limits on intellectual freedom, reinforces group divisions, promotes a feeling of enmity and grievance sometimes. So when you have cultural appropriation, sometimes your freedom is limited. How much will you appropriate? How much of your original culture are you going to leave behind? There are group divisions. You're going to be different. You're going to be the exotic other. So then the others who are strict with culture are going to be away from, from you. The dominant culture and people who follow it fully are going to be away from you. So you will be moving into another group. Promotes a feeling of enmity and grievance. Sometimes your own family may not accept you. Your own society may not accept you. So there will be enmity. Cultural tradition. This includes religious traditions, fashion, symbols, language, and music. It could be any. Just because we do not follow a particular custom in a religion, it doesn't mean we are rude to the religion or we are moving away. So everything can be a cultural tradition. Either you wear a few things, adorn yourself because it is religious tradition or you do the same things because it is fashion. The picture on the slide can give you an example. The left man must be wearing it because it's a custom in his religion or community. And the person on the right may be wearing it. He also is wearing, uh, you know, a, a year wearing or a year stud. It's not a stud. It has a hang, a, a piece hanging. So she, he must be wearing it because of fashion. So how do you want to uh, become a symbol? The first person may be for his community. The second person for his style. Similarly, language, music. I have seen many people say, stick on to this language, you know, don't move, don't learn anything, you know, new. Do not speak the other language, speak only this language. So, you know, it depends upon how that person wants to project himself. There are states which say they do not want Hindi. They, they don't want to learn many languages. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, mocking at them, of course. They must be having their love for their language. But the reason could be they want to project themselves. I'm not for or against it. The way you project your, your culture, you are giving maximum importance to your culture. And it works sometimes because they have been successful in having their language departments in many countries. So music too can be a, a culture. You know, what kind of music do you like? What kind of music the other people in your place like? Now, BTS is becoming a culture. And I tell you, it is even affecting English language. You must have heard that uh, uh, if you want to say you like somebody, it is not like and it, not, it is not romantic love, but you simply love them. You say, I purple you. So that is a new uh, word that comes in with a new meaning. Purple already existed, but it has, uh, um, you know, got a new meaning now, like connotation and denotation. Culture may be used against the expressly stated wishes of the members of the originating culture. So it is used to express the wish of the people who originally follow the culture. <clears throat> what is inappropriate? Sometimes it's harmful. Violation of the collective intellectual property rights of indigenous culture. When you try to move away and then you uh, appropriate some other culture absolutely, the indigenous culture is defeated. There is nobody to support it. Unavoidable when multiple cultures come together, but we cannot stop this. The world is moving further and further into cultural pluralism. So we cannot avoid this. The picture on the screen you see is a picture of two women taking, taken in uh, 19, between 1905 and 1910. This is 
the traditional attire of Tamil women. Uh, their hair all neatly combed, flowers a must, and look at the articulation of the jewelry, the silk sari, and the ornaments they wear. Uh, I believe, except for one or two, all the rest of the Tamil population wouldn't own any of these antique style jewelry, including the anklets, they call it chilangai. They used to regularly wear. So this was part of the indigenous culture. But how many South Indian women do we see uh, still wanting to dress this way? So this culture has, uh, uh, you know, almost died. Maybe you can see them when people dance on the stage for Bharat Natyam. Even then, they don't include all these ornaments. Now, I do not say women should be dressing this way. Hope you get me right. I'm just talking about indigenous culture and how we ourselves have changed from that because of cultural appropriation. One good example of being proud of one's culture is Velunachia, the queen of Shiva Gangai. I always wanted to give an example of Velunachia because she's a splendid queen. Many a time we talk about foreign queens. We talk about queens from another land, from some other country, trying to fight, trying to move on, trying to keep their people together. Now, Velu Nachia was the only daughter to her parents. She is the queen of Shiva Gangai, married to the king of Shiva Gangai at a very young age. Her husband... She, she was trained in four languages. She could speak English, French, German very fluently, apart from Indian languages. She was well-versed in warfare. She was taught all uh, kinds of battlement, fighting with all kinds of weapon. She understood her job was to protect her people. And therefore, she studied everything well. When the British people start to conquer her kingdom. They kill her husband. She doesn't break down. She rushes to Hyderabad, asks Hyderali to help her. He immediately offers help and she finds out the storehouse of the arms and ammunitions of, her British, of the British people. She blows it up, fights, collects her people, gives them strength, just like Joan of Arc, gives them strength and then beats and defeats the British people away, becomes the queen of Shiva Gangai and rules for 10 long years and passes on the kingdom to her daughter. She lives up to 66. She never gets killed. She lives her life successfully, fighting against the British. So we have people amongst us who have been creating history whom we have forgotten. I would like to show you a small clipping about Velu Nachiar. I'm afraid the video doesn't play here. Can you see it playing? Can anyone tell me the video is playing? No, madam. No, madam. No, okay. okay. I had just uh, I had a small documentary about Velunachia for you to understand the place she was born in. Anyway, we don't waste time. We move on to the... Next slide. That's just a, 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 a small song. It runs only for three minutes. It was created by a professor from America who does a lot of research on cultural studies. His name is uh, Father Tony and he does research on Tamil culture. And he found out uh, the importance of Queen Velunachiar and he has made a small song, a rap almost, not a melodious song. It's like a rap 
talking about the strength uh, that uh, Velinacci or show during those days when uh, queens, you know, were few. There were kings all over. There were around four or five queens ruling here and there. Anyway, I'm sorry the video doesn't work. It worked yesterday. Moving on to cultural resistance. Cultural resistance is the practice of using meanings and symbols that is culture to contest and combat a dominant power, often constructing a different vision of the world in the process. So you are trying to fight against something that is dominating you. It can be power that is dominating you. It can be a different vision. The modern theory of cultural resistance was first articulated in the mid 19th century by Matthew Arnold in his essay, Culture and Anarchy. This is the textbook in the beginning for culture, culture and anarchy. After that, uh, you will get a lot of points. I took most of my uh, you know, notes from um, cultural studies, texts and context by Prantik Banerjee. And there are a lot of books. Most of you must have read an introduction to cultural studies by Pramod Nair. He is also wonderful. So you can see how different types of culture work in the world. The modern theory of cultural resistance was first articulated in the mid 19th century by Matthew Arnold in his essay, Culture and Anarchy. Now, how does culture work in contested terrains? The dominant ideology is not reproduced. You don't want to follow the rules laid down. Cultural resistance happens. You resist, you can't protest, so you resist. Foucault believes in power trying to bring forth opposition and resistance. If you try to bring in too much of authority, there will be opposition. Wherever you must have noticed, wherever there is too much of domination, there will be resistance. Power seeks to contain and control such resistances. So when people resist, power tries to contain these resistances. It incorporates hegemony. It incorporates domination. It incorporates power. Resistance is counter power. So when there is power telling you to do things which you do not like, the counter is through resistance. Response to power's expression. Resistance is also a response to expression of power by authoritative figures. This is one example which I would like to give you. In the West, they were always supposed to dress in a prim and proper manner. In, the, in all the novels you must have read, especially British literature, you must have noticed that uh, official way of dressing was always with discipline. There was a rule that you cannot grow your hair any way you like, and especially women should not tattoo themselves. So during the 1970s, there was a new culture called punk culture, P-U-N-K, where those who resisted this authority dressed any way they liked. On the left, you have picture of two boys. On the right, you have picture of a woman who has tattooed all over her body. So they wanted to resist this culture, power as culture, and now they respond by resistance as culture. Now, what are the different forms? That one was only for code of dressing. Now, there are, you know, resistances propping up for various reasons. Micro-political gestures of contempt, just like alienation in the classroom. You must have noticed gangs in the classroom. One gang dresses in a particular way. They uh, have their own choices of music. Another gang has its own choice of music, its own way of dressing. Full-scale social and political revolutions like suffrage, women fighting for votes. We got our voting right only in the 20th century. Until then, they thought women did not have the common sense enough to even vote. So that also was cultural resistance. We resisted against that rule that discriminated women. Involves transgression. You go beyond the limits like Satyagraha. You transgress and then try to attract the attention of the person in authority saying, I don't like what you're saying. I will do what I like. Exceeding acceptable boundaries set by established customs. So you have a certain custom in your society. You have a certain custom in your religion. And it, you find it absolutely non-progressive and you resist it. You exceed the boundary. In brackets, I have given you the name of Anuradha Ramanan, my favorite Tamil writer. She's a short story writer. That is Anuradha Ramanan. You see, she's dressed in bright colors. She has good jewels. 
She has a bright smile. She has a beautiful nose stud. She has been these. One between the eyebrows and one in the hairline. Just before, on top of her forehead. She has shaped eyebrows and she has taken care of herself. Now, why do I explain this picture or describe the way she looks in this picture? Uh, this is a photograph taken after she lost her husband. She, of course, loved her husband very much. But then she understood that trying to shave her hair, not wearing a bindi, not wearing bangles and jewels, doesn't mean she loved her husband more. These physiological expressions have nothing to do with her successful relationship with her husband. So she was considered a controversial writer because she exceeded the custom. In a career that spanned over 30 years, Anuradha wrote nearly 800 novels. Can you imagine that? And 1,230 short stories. One of her early works, Sirai, won a gold medal for the best short story from, from Ananda Vikitan, was controversial and unconventional in every way, was threatened for the same. Uh, she did not fight with anybody. She just expressed herself, but she would get phone calls threatening that she would be killed. She would get abusive phone calls from important people. That was the uh, greatest uh, tragedy from people who are very popular outside. Uh, asking her to come over just because she dresses colorfully. Examples of youth subculture, different environment, expression of beliefs and altitude counter to adult world. That's what perhaps we call the generation gap. When that goes beyond a particular limit, it becomes youth subculture. They don't accept our beliefs. They have their own beliefs. Deeper than adoption of particular clothing style, it doesn't stop with the clothes that they wear or the lipstick that they wear or the hairstyle that they have, it is deeper than that. Deeper than adoption of musical tastes. It is not just uh, the music that they love, it's deeper than that. Yet, resolutions represented are imaginary. Though the way they resolve their conflict is just imaginary. It does not stand for a long time. They are like resistance through rituals. Resistance also for them is a ritual. They can do it only for a short while. You must have seen the picture. I think somebody's mic is on. Somebody has not muted her mic. Okay. So that is also only temporary. Symbolic resistance gives opportunities for personal expression. It is only for a short while until the boy finishes college or the girl finishes college. It's just an expression shown to you that I will dress only the way I like. I don't want anybody to interfere in it. But young people make the transition. They also have to go beyond. They have to make the transition to the demands of work, marriage and family. So as soon as college is over, they apply for a job. They cut their hair prim and proper, dress very well, fall into line very quickly and then follow the norms customs of the society similarly for marriage similarly for the sake of family they adjust so this particular expression of youth subculture is always a custom it moves like a ritual and it is short-lived this is one more example of a, a community enjoying its freedom uh, youth culture lgbt celebrating after, after the supreme court accepted their rights culture and gender <coughs> Discussions about relationships between men and women are discussed in this. The inequality in society, natural hierarchy leads to natural inequality. Female associated with nature and male with culture. It's always that way in most societies. Female with a private and male with a public. More than 50% of the families have women sitting at home, just running the family. They feel... It's okay for men to be professional, but only few women become professional. That is why female with private and male with public. Argument is similar to clan or caste issues. It's just like a caste problem, gender problem also. It's kind of a discrimination. Change is a phenomenon. Culture must be experienced differently. Culture may be organized differently. 
So it, you must be ready to accept different kinds of culture. It's not tolerance anymore. Women anthropologists believe that much of the writings of non-Western societies is formulated in terms of Western assumptions. So most of those writings, Western feminists think about their problems. Transnational feminism was born, therefore, for the third world women. And for example, I would give you the story of Carnegie. Many of you, if you are from Tamil Nadu, will be familiar with the uh, story of Carnegie. It is a, a bit of Silapadikaram, a traditional textbook where her husband Kovalan moves away from her, falls in love with another person called Madhavi and starts living with her. For two years, he enjoys with Madhavi. Her mother was very cunning. After squeezing out all his wealth and money and they realized that they could not squeeze him anymore, they push him out of the house. They means Madhavi's mother. Madhavi still must have loved Kovalan, but they're not legally married, so she cannot uh, talk about any right there. But Kanagi was legally married to Kovalan. When he was thrown out, he comes back to Kanagi. Kanagi, though hurt, accepts him and both move on to Madurai for the sake of business. And the only wealth they had was Kanagi's two anklets. So she gives one and says, you can go sell it, make money and we will start business. But unfortunately, the queen of the place had lost her anklet and the goldsmith mistakes Kovalan because nobody else had such a beautiful anklet. It's not just an anklet, it's called Shilangai. It is hollow in between. You must have seen it in the picture that I showed you about two women. Uh, it's hollow inside and there are beads, diamonds, rubies, pearls inside, whichever you can afford. And the goldsmith thinks, oh, this looks, this is just the queen's anklet. And he immediately informs the king's guards and they arrest Kovalan. The king too, thinking, looking at the anklet, looks just like the queen's anklet, immediately orders for Kovalan to be beheaded. News comes to Kanagi saying that her husband was beheaded for stealing the queen's anklet. She immediately, in a new place, nobody to support her, no parents, no generally women rush to the lawyer and the advocate and the you know women's rights uh, uh, you know cell. With all that, we still have trouble in managing issues. She walks in without any fear into uh, Nerinjarian, the king's um, palace fights, asks the king how he could behead her husband without a proper trial. She asks the queen what are the ornaments she had inside the anklet and the queen says pearls. She throws the other anklet she had in her hand on the floor. They break and she said I have rubies, just see. And when the anklet breaks, rubies run out. King Nedinjarian realizes his mistake and you know what he does? He commits suicide. This is a real story, historical event brought in, in the form of a poem into Silapadikaram. So imagine the grit and uh, uh, strength of women in the transnational world to fight for themselves. Here in modern age, in spite of being educated, in spite of being, you know, having so many people to help out, we struggle. Not all of us, but many of us. We are afraid. But we had women in our country who were culturally bold, who were confident that they were right and who could fight for themselves. So it's no more just, uh, you know, fighting for rights. We had women who fought for their rights and her anger had, is supposed to have set Madurai in, 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 on fire and then she walks away from Tamil Nadu and comes to Kerala. And even today, a temple stands as a symbol of Kanagi. Uh, Kodungallur is the temple that was built for the sake of Kanagi. So uh, there also you have other issues, you know, why she might have to walk away and then why she was accepted and what happened. It was a washerwoman who permitted, nobody would permit a woman who comes alone at night and knocks your door, even today. People think twice before letting you in because of all the problems around in society. You don't trust people. You don't know who this woman is. Uh, but even in those days, people were not ready to accept the lady. And it was a washerwoman who opened the door for Carnegie. That is why even today in that temple, people who belong to that community have first rights. So then what? why do we talk about caste at all? Isn't it? So transnational feminism is one form. The conventional roles a male-dominated social system, 
based on convention, based on nature of persons. The idea of duality and dichotomy always has existed. Women are what men are not. Men decide who men are and then women are doubly excluded. So it, the social norms are all set based on the comfort zones of men and then women are included or excluded. I would like to discuss one book. It's a simple book. Most of you may have read Anita Desai, Fire on the Mountain, which is a good example of culture and gender. Patriarchal fundamentalism shown traditionally feminine values such as reciprocity, nurturing and cooperation. I express. So if you are a woman, you should know to nurture. If you are a man, you can escape. You need not nurture. You needn't even carry your own baby. But a woman, you should carry your own baby. That is the culture that is already existing. There should be cooperation. You have to cooperate. Whether you like it or not, wherever you go, you have to cooperate. But it's okay for uh, you know men if they find it difficult to cooperate. Oppression by a patriarchal society. The darker aspects of the women are seen in this cultural study. That is gender and culture. In this book, you see the protagonist Nanda Kaul, who wants to enjoy solace on the lap of nature and Kasoli and consider it a peaceful retirement resort after having a life full of troubles and the labor of daily routine. She wants to do away with the disturbing mundanity. Imagine a, a grandmother wanting to retire. How would our society accept it? In families like yours and mine, maybe they accept. We are educated. We don't want to trouble our parents. So we permit them to live their life freely. But is that the culture generally when you move into the society? Can you accept a mother retiring from family life and moving on her own way? Duties prescribed for her. Important position of being the wife of a vice chancellor of a university. Have to be in official costumes all the while receiving and seeing of guests. Have to play the role of a host, wife, mother, sister, housekeeper, homemaker, event manager, family planner, child raiser, peacemaker, well-meaner and a savior of the family in all situations. She has to play these roles successfully. She's stuck in life where she had no time even to resist growing inequalities meted out to her. The exploitation of female labor clearly comes out in every page of the novel. She wants to do away with the disturbing mundanity. So she decides once the vice chancellor dies, she would separate the property. She had five children. She would separate it as six. She'll have one share for herself and give the other five and she would retire with her share. She gets a call and then she moves away to Himalayas. It was her dream. It's mine too. She buys a beautiful villa, Karig Nano, that place is called. And she decides to settle there, far away from all the chaos and mundanity. But then she gets a call from her daughter to be ready to accept her great-granddaughter, Raka, and keep her at Karig Nano for a while. So she gets a call. So she had only decided to become unconventional. Generally, grandmothers don't do that. Once the children are married, they await the roles of becoming grandmothers. The novel depicts multidimensional forms of living. These images have been employed to examine human relationships and their significance. The unconventional choice of retiring from the family's responsibilities made by Nanda may not be highly appreciated, but she's forced to come to a compromise. Maybe nobody enjoyed the mother going away like that and living for herself. But then she was forced to have come to a compromise because she had to help her daughter again. She wants to be left alone. She's quite sure that she has completed her duty in life by seeing her family and kin well cared for by herself throughout her life and takes a decision to be left to the pines and cicadas alone. She hoped she would not stop. So she wanted to be left alone with the pines and cicadas of the Himalayas. Nanda is attracted to Karignano for its barrenness that equalizes her. The lonely house is symbolic of the solitary life of Nanda. She must have felt after doing all these chores, she hadn't achieved anything personally. It's not a complaint about working hard. Everybody works hard. The man must be giving his share to the family in the form of income, going to the office. The woman must be, who's not employed, running around, taking care of kids, uh, mental and physical stress shared. But in the end, how much have you achieved? What's, what's your address? You know, that kind of a vacuum comes into Nanda's mind. Revenge is considered punishment. 
The novel goes on to bring Ila Das to visit Nanda, her school classmate. She is the welfare officer of the government and tries to educate people to take a child infected with tetanus to the clinic straight away. So she realizes that Nanda was living in the Himalayas in Carignano and she comes to see her old time schoolmate. And when she was moving around doing social service in the valley, she realizes that there was a child infected with tetanus and they were trying to do something, some ritual and trying to cure it instead of taking it to a clinic. So she was telling them, the child will die, please take it to the clinic. She also tries to stop a child marriage and ends up having enemies. She herself is not aware of. So she tries to stop a child marriage and tries to tell the father to educate the daughter otherwise she will suffer in life. But then the father becomes her enemy. She does not realize it. She tries to tackle the father, Preet Singh, but could not convince him. She failed in convincing him. The night she returns from Carignano, she gets late after buying things. Even the footpath already was lost in the evening shadow of the mountains. She never realized her thoughts of well-meaning did not strike the right chords in the mind of Preet Singh. She is accosted by a man who held her throat hard. He tore at her clothes, raped her, pinned her down and strangulates her. She dies. Difficult to please patriarchal ego. This brings out the punishment given to her by a dominating male figure of the locality. For intruding into his affairs, rape is considered a punishment. They feel this is what you deserve if you interfere in my ways. He has been a beast in his reaction, not understanding that Ila Das had after all tried to save his own child from misfortune. He had no foresight, no forethought, nor any understanding of what the future had in stake for his daughter, but his patriarchal ego would let his inner eye never open. There are many, this is one example of how Culture and gender works in English literature. Texts are encoded with dominant ideology. So you have so many textbooks. But all these textbooks, remember, are written by people living in a particular country, in a particular society, in a particular culture. Now, you can never say you do not have any culture to follow. You would be having certainly your own personal culture. Stuart Hall's essay, Encoding and Decoding, suggests this. Encoding of TV program makers might not be straightforwardly decoded by an audience. Maybe the TV program maker didn't think of anything when he produced it. But when we encode it, we encode it by sitting in a particular culture. Encoded texts have dominant ideology. Now, an Indian ad to a chisman will think of Indian family systems. It is preferred reading. So when the ad comes, the advertiser prefers you to look at it that way. But viewing is negotiation between it and the viewer. So when I watch the ad, there is a negotiation between the advertiser and myself. How does today's woman decode an ad where only women are used for washing soaps, kitchen utensils, cooking items? How does a new generation girl decode the scenes of movies? This is one example of a movie. Um, Chinna Thambi, I think that is a Tamil movie where they sh there is a scene where for the uh, the hero runs off somewhere because he fell in love with a rich girl and to bring the hero the, the brothers of the girl catch hold of the widow of the hero who is dressed in white always those days if you are a widow you are not supposed to adorn a bindi and you are not supposed to use colors at all you have to wear only white and the punishment is shown in the form of throwing colors on her. She's tied to a pole. This, this movie came around 30 years ago. And the punishment is throwing colors, red, green, blue. And the, uh, and the woman is shown as if she's wincing in pain because she can't accept that treatment. Of course, the treatment was rude. That way we can say there is gender bias. But throwing colors on, on, a, on, on a widow, I don't think, uh, is going to, you know... Uh, disturb any widow nowadays even calling them a widow widow uh, you know so, sounds so rude they met somebody they live with that person and then now you know they are alone that's all so that is how it's pictured so that's preferred reading so those days maybe they thought it was terrible 
So that is why even when the ad is played, the producer produces it with preferred reading. But there's a negotiation happening between the viewer and the ad. <coughs> Everything blooms out of culture. Resistance. Symbolic performance of cultural conflict. Brings together conventional and unconventional identities. So you have a conflict between this all the time. Protest organized in the House of Lords by a group of women on 2nd February 1988 against Clause 28, that is LGBT rights. Clause 28 prevents the promotion of homosexuality. Three women have sailed down into the chamber, supported by people from the public gallery, upset the authority of the chamber. This is how they resisted this. There are limits to transgression. Some Salman Rushdie's books are carnival sang in, in relation to literature. Midnight Children, 26 September 1988, the Satnik Verses was published. It was banned on 5th October. The book was burnt in demonstrations in England. So people who cannot accept what he wrote are not happy with the book. Resistance in Midnight Children. What he does is he criticizes the postmodern independent governments of India and Pakistan. He criticizes international cultural conflict. Criticizes racism in England. Culture is collective. Uh, there is a scene in Midnight Children. Salman Rushdie had beautifully shown, you know, in the form of a, a number, 1001. Thousand and one children were born on the border of the day of the partition. And out of which only 541 or so survived. And they have a psychological connection with each other. That is how the novel goes. And he is trying to predict that if there's cultural conflict all the time, even India would be broken up into 1,001 pieces, just like the number of children. There is a flowers there with uh, Mohammed Sinai, uh, you know, uh, seas blown up in a, uh, in a bomb blast. And he thinks India also will break up like this <clears throat> if we have conflict all the time. And slowly, you can see states separating, divisions happening, just like Amit of Ghosh in Shadow Lines. Uh, you know, talks about political lines just being shadow lines. Of course, now Andhra Pradesh had no line, but then there's another line now. So these lines will keep on changing. The more the conflict, the more the pieces the country would be, break into. Culture is collective, held in common. Individuals willingly subordinate themselves. So you naturally accept. Oh, you like this culture? You accept. <laughs> This masks the reality. Culture is authored. Always a society or a group of people author it. It's up to you to like it or dislike it. Heterogeneity in the maze. It's already a maze. Different cultures brought into contact. Migration paves way. That's another reason. Powerful inter international culture industry. Things considered sacred in one culture are treated irrelevant when they come into contact with another culture. That is true. What is sacred in your culture may be not very sacred in another culture. We have to accept it. Transgression, sacrilege and blasphemy are part and parcel of postmodern culture. So transgression is common. What is very important for you may not be important for somebody else. Now, even taking uh, the way Anuradha Ramanan dresses, that is part of the place she was grown up in. Now, an Indian who was born and brought up in America or England wouldn't want a bindi at all, whether she is married or unmarried or a widow. She wouldn't want a bindi because she hasn't lived in a culture where that's considered a, an adornment. That is considered a part of beauty. One more book I would like to discuss is In Search of April Rain Tree. I selected this book because many of you may be familiar. And what is familiar will help you look at it in the right point of view. 17th century European settlement, whites pursued fur trade, center of economic activity, Canada, we are talking about. She's a Canadian writer. Economic, political, personal alliance, country marriages, mixed blood, Métis culture is seen in the book. True to life autobiographical fiction offers insight into the Métis culture. Identity quest theme is seen in the book. Chronicles the life of the Métis sisters, April and Cheryl. I concentrate on Fosterhood. 
maybe you can think uh, th- analyze a book in the point of feminism from the point of post colonialism but i look that is why i used it to express culture uh, fosterhood that is how there is a culture in canada where nobody becomes orphaned generally there may be orphanages but you always have something called foster parenthood alcoholic parents april and cheryl have alcoholic parents they get drunk overnight and they don't take care of what's happening in their house april is taken by the child protection people and left with the dines and the de rosiers for some time cheryl is taken from the parents and kept with the mcadams and the stain dolls for some time and they have an other childhood uh, there is a scene where the children are taken away from the parents the parents do not earn enough are not taking care of the children properly so the child protection people think they are safer in some other family but the children cry to run back and hug their parents that scene is uh, really very sensitive there is multiplicity racism april shuns identity when you feel nobody respects you for a particular reason then it's natural for a child to not belong to that or not uh, copy that so she shuns her own identity but cheryl takes pride there are children like cheryl who take pride in their identity and ask the rest to go take a walk discrimination is seen poverty and alcoholism searching for a bounded and unitary self is seen the search escaping true identity searching for true identity that is what april does accepting true identity what cheryl does she likes to call herself canadian there is a scene in the novel where she attends the wedding ceremony of april she marries a white guy and one of the ladies they ask her what people are you what do they call you so immediately cheryl understood uh, what they were aiming at so she said i am a woman so immediately the other person said i didn't mean that i want to know what people you are so she said i am a canadian so she didn't want to say matey she was she was just giving a nudge to the other ladies you know sarcasm repudiating true identity that is what april did she, she was uh, her skin tone was fairish so she could easily pass off as a white girl so she repudiated her culture but they become victims of mixed culture and they have dual inheritance so they fall into a dichotomy interest in culture grows expanded notions of politics lead to an increasing interest in the role of culture now as uh, world culture approaches we have started understanding our role garments are conducted on a terrain created and circumscribed through culture small things like dress language and the organization of an office can be the site of meaning where important battles are fought out dress can be culture even in the office you go to the way you dress and the way the others dress could become cultural resistance cultural appropriation or cultural conflict it depends dialogues debates disputes and outright conflict cannot be easily categorized you never know why there was a debate on such a topic you never know when there is a dispute <laughs> only when the dispute arises you realize oh they do not follow my culture representation and performance are much of the moment so you have to either you're in a new place and you represent your culture or you perform well and live up to the new culture symbols make culture symbols that announce peace in one society can mean hatred and war in another snakes are worshiped in one religion while detested in another touching a dead body is punished with death in one and is perfectly fine in another colors that show political alliance also speak about culture so you have meanings in everything symbols in everything now for example white is not at all inauspicious in kerala but when you go away from kerala they don't accept white for weddings most of the time they go in for colors so there can be color politics we must think of what harold pinter said in art truth and politics he explores reality in war innocent people always suffer he has rightly said usa's military dictatorship in indonesia greece uruguay guatemala el salvador and chile has been discussed by harold pinter in his essay invasion of iraq he calls a bandit act 
Pinter's speech for Bush. There is a speech that he has written for the sake of Bush. God is good. God is great. God is good. My God is good. Bin Laden's God is bad. This is a bad God. Saddam's God was bad. Except he didn't have one. He was a barbarian. We are not barbarians. We don't chop people's heads off. We believe in freedom. So does God. I'm not a barbarian. I'm the democratically elected leader of a freedom-loving democracy. We are a compassionate society. We give compassionate electrocution and compassionate lethal injection. We are a great nation. I'm not an 11 dictator. He is. I'm not a barbarian. He is and he is. They all are. I possess moral authority. You see this fist? This is my moral authority. And don't you forget it. This is what Pinter mockingly wrote as a speech for Bush then. But maybe he was aiming at the cultural conflict and misunderstanding in the world today. Trans transgression is sometimes slippery. Notions are slippery. You do not know what, what people say and you do not know whether they stick to their words. During the carnival, you do not know who is wearing what mask. There was a protest against uh, child rape. And in the procession, in the front row, there was an old man holding one side of the cloth banner. And later on, the entire society was shocked to find that he himself had sexually abused his grandchild. So everybody thought he joined the crowd in fighting for the sake of the child's rights. So we don't know who's wearing the mask. An important site of contestation in cultural politics is around questions of identity. We do not even know the identity of a person, whether he is really accepting your ideas. Does he accept your, uh, you know, culture? Is he a person who will move along with the crowd and walk, work for world peace? Cultural politics describes a shifting, transient arena in which meanings are constantly in dispute. So meanings will be constantly in dispute. Even morality is a question now. It's so scary to teach in 21st century classrooms. So we have to leave literature as literature. We cannot move on to teach moral morality. Since I belong to a minority institution, we have a class called moral science, moral values every Monday as a class teacher. That is the only class I'm very nervous about. All other classes, I'm very confident. I prepare, I read the book, analyze, read secondary material about the book, make notes, try my best to be the best that day and walk into class. But on the day of moral values class, I feel so nervous because I have had atheists in my class. I have lesbians in my class. I have people who support LGBT in my class. I have people who have their own community and culture in my class. So what will be a common moral instruction I would be giving them? So morality itself has become a subjective issue. What is looked as moral for me may not be moral for you. Many of us must have gotten into arranged marriages. You ask today's generation, they will ask you, how did you ever marry this guy whom you have never met? And all the time during PTA meetings, parents come in, especially because mine is a women's college, they come with complaints saying that she uses the phone more than the necessary limit overnight. Now as a teacher, what will be my role during that PTA meeting? Should I tell the parent to take away the Android phone from the student's hands? Or should I tell the student, don't use it unnecessarily now that the classes have all become online? How long will a parent or a teacher stand behind a student and see that if she's browsing appropriately? So morality itself has become a subjective matter. How much, how much freedom we have to instruct another person about being moral itself is a million dollar question. Now moving to the last part of my presentation, the resolution. So what is the resolution for this cultural conflict, cultural resistance? 
gender politics, culture and gender. To be individual, to write with your innate beliefs. Hold your heart at the tip of your pen. Imitate only when in invited. So you be yourself. You weigh what you like. You talk the way you like as far as you don't hurt anybody. Write what you believe is right. Hold your heart at the tip of your pen. Do not imitate unless you're invited. You be yourself. I would like to give you an example of advocate Karuna Nandi. You know who she is. She played a significant role in drafting the women, womanifesto and framing of the anti-rape bill after the Delhi gang rape. Her keen interest to contribute for gender rights has taken her to international tribunals and the United Nations. Despite of all the laws, what she seems to urgently suggest is implementation of a public education program to take down patriarchy, since that seems to be a public health concern. So right from first standard, we must stop keeping, you know, children separated. At least till a particular standard, boys and girls should be made to sit together. They should know that they are all human beings. Most of the time, boys sit on one side, girls sit on the other. So naturally, they feel there is a difference. That's why they do this. It should start from school. That's why she said it has become, it's not a matter of shame. It's not a matter of rape. It's not a matter of discrimination. It has become a public health concern. So they don't understand that women get hurt. Women get killed. All the acid attacks that happen, not only psychological bruise, the physical bruise and the pain that the woman goes through. So she wanted a change in it. Another example is Deepika Singh Rajavat, who fought for the Kashmiri uh, girl who was abused. Rajavat has been a hero to many because of her defiance against her own colleagues in the Jammu Bar Association, who threatened her against taking up the case. There were many people who said, you don't take this case up, it's dangerous. How often do we see such a photo? All men around her walking respectfully, focusing on their job that day, and she walking in the center, being respected, considered an equal, considered to be an able advocate, fighting for a righteous cause. <coughs> Deepika's words, I don't know till when I will be alive. I can be raped. My modesty can be outraged. I can be killed. I can be damaged. I was threatened yesterday that we will not forgive you. I'm going to tell the Supreme Court tomorrow that I'm in danger. Deepika had told news agency ANI. I'm not scared of threats. We'll fight this case and make sure our child gets the justice. So culturally, our ideas must change. Culturally, we have to become more acceptable. Gone is the time when we spoke about cultural tolerance. Gone is the time when we spoke about religious tolerance. Tolerance is a word used when you do not like what somebody is doing, but you tolerate it. You permit the person to continue because you can't do anything else in that situation and you tolerate it. So that is a negative way of looking at multiple cultures. Now is the time to talk about cultural acceptance, religious acceptance political acceptance. There is a situation where even in college, people are divided on the basis of politics. Let there be different parties. Let we have to accept each other. So there should be religious acceptance. I pray this way. You pray the other way. Wonderful. Okay, in my religion, this is how we pray. This is an exercise for our hip. Oh, in your religion, you pray this way. That must be an exercise for your shoulders. So look at it in the form of positivity. So let us stop talking about tolerance and let us start talking about acceptance. So cultural studies is an area which is so vast, everything under it cannot be brought into a talk that is within one and a half hours. But then I may have given you a glimpse into the various possibilities in this theory. And I would like you to read some of the recent textbooks, especially one written by Simon Gunn, History and Cultural Theory, which is worth reading. And I pray this presentation today must have opened the floodgates of interest in cultural studies in all the listeners today. Happy reading. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. It was indeed a very wonderful and mesmerizing session. And we got many points about the aesthetic, the aspects of the culture studies. It was indeed very pleasure to have you here, ma'am. And it was indeed an awesome session about the culture studies. Now it's a turn Thank for the participants to ask questions related to the topic to the uh, to ma'am. And uh, I invite Ashwati ma'am to moderate the session. Participants, you can put the questions in the chat box, okay? Thank you, Nila, ma'am. It was indeed an excellent session. We are so Thank honored uh, to be with you in this wonderful session. Uh, dear participants, now you can, uh, if you have any queries and questions, you can ask Nila, ma'am, now. You can post your questions in the chat box and ma'am will handle you. Okay. Please. Was my presentation clear? Yes. Maybe that is why there are no questions. We don't know. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. I see many people encouraging me. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Oh, that I don't know. I'm growing every day, reading every day. Am I speaking to Ashwati, Dr. Ashwati? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you also, all of you. You're such a lovely department. You work with such good chemistry. Yes, ma'am. English department should be like that. That is the culture you should spread to your students. Ma'am, everybody is commenting that your lecture was very clear and you cleared all the doubts and <laughs> very interesting. Is it? Okay. Thank you so much. I would prefer many of you read up and do your research on cultural studies because that is going to be the most recent, you know, topics that will be important in research now. It's not just English. I'm so happy when your principal said yours is a functional English department. It should be function, functional English because among 30 or 50 people who do English literature, only two or three will become professors. All the rest will need you know, to speak English well for their jobs. Ma'am, excuse me, here we have one question. Yes. Uh, this Payal Dalal. Okay, I can ask one question. Mm. Can really? we read cultural studies with uh, trauma theory? Actually, okay. do, uh, the person is doing this uh, research on trauma theory. Okay, okay. Trauma theory is absolutely different from cultural studies. But you can use culture as a means to explain trauma theory. There are so many theorists. If you browse, you'll get a basic idea. But if you go to the national libraries, you'll get a lot of books based on trauma theory alone. But culture can lead to trauma. There may be many reasons why trauma happens. It could be a pandemic, like, for example, Corona, COVID-19. You had a movie called Virus. We have American movies where they show the trauma of isolation, trauma of discrimination. So that is different. That has nothing to do with culture there. But then culture can also be a reason for trauma. So you can use culture as a means to move and analyze with trauma theory. And we have... Uh, if you're doing research... Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, then we have another question, ma'am, by Anubama Roy. Ma'am, can you okay. suggest some books in the discipline? Some books in yes, the discipline. Yes, I have already mentioned. You have, if you have a book, you could please write it down. Cultural studies, texts and contexts. I myself uh, took many of my points from that book. Cultural studies, texts and contexts by Prantik Banerjee. That's an Indian book. <coughs> One more. Cultural studies. A Practical Introduction by Michael Ryan, R-Y-A-N, M-I-C-H-A-L, Michael Ryan, R-Y-A-N. <coughs> you can also read New Cultural mm -hmm. Studies 
by Gary Hall and Claire Birchley. New Cultural Studies. If you are writing, it would be useful for you. The title of the book is New Cultural Studies and the authors are Gary Hall, G-A-R-Y, Gary Hall and Claire Birchley. Then, of course, which I already mentioned in my talk by John Story. What is Cultural Studies? What is Cultural Studies? By John Story. History and Cultural Theory by Simon Gunn. History and Cultural Theory by Simon Gunn. These are all good books to use for research when you're doing your research on cultural studies. Ma'am, we have another question. I think that uh, Payal has got the correct answers to her questions. And we have another question by Krishna Priya. Yes. How do you address yes. individual crisis and alienation in the purview of cultural studies? Okay. Individual crisis depends on what kind of individual crisis you are facing. I had given one example in my presentation that was transnational feminism. Now that could be, a, now I gave you an example of Karnagi. That is an individual crisis. Her problem may be different from a white woman's problem or another woman's problem. Similarly, your foot binding cases in China, which happened long ago, that comes under imperialism. That came down because of their culture, which was negative for especially the uh, royal women. All women were not forced to have foot binding, but some women did suffer. So that's an individual problem. So you have to approach those individual problems based on what kind of individual study you are doing. It comes under, you know, the common umbrella of cultural studies, but you have to choose. Is it feminism? Is it imperialism? Or is it discrimination? Based on that, you have to plan your textbook and your theory. Okay, thank you, ma'am. We have a, a lot of questions here now. So, Shinsu Jain she has asked one question. To what extent do faculty members, research scholars and students comprehend the cultural aspect while reading or teaching any text? Mm, this is just like, thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Shinsu. Uh, this is just like uh, Stuart saying encoding and decoding. Uh, when you learned uh, solitary reaper in 10th standard, the English teacher would have given you one explanation. The same poem in 12th standard, you found another explanation. And when we came to college, we had an absolutely different understanding. Each teacher had her own way of expressing what culture is. So it depends on what culture the teacher comes from also, the way she looks at it. Now, for example, we have an, uh, an essay called Thinking Sex by Gail Rubin. And the Calcutt University for MA, we teach an essay called Thinking Sex. So I'm forced to uh, talk from being just a human being. Now, I being a person with a lot of cultural acceptance, I never force my ideas on my students. So I say, this is what the essay says and explain it to them. I don't even tell them that they should not do this or should do this. I explain the essay and leave it to them. It's up to them to accept erotic behavior or leave erotic behavior. The essay suggests that your body is yours and nobody has a right to make you use it this way or that way. This is how the essay says. So imagine the teacher's role in trying to explain that essay. So uh, sometimes I feel it depends on the teachers. I, the, some of the teachers may have comprehended uh, uh, cultural analysis properly, but I do not know if all the teachers will be doing it. It depends on which culture they come from. The more progressive uh, and broad-minded the teachers are, the better the interpretation will be. And I feel we all should move into more progressive thinking rather than narrow-minded thinking. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And here is another question by Shiva Shankari SK. Her question is, which practitioners of cultural analysis... I can't hear you. Ma'am, am I audible now? I can't now? hear you. Yes. Ma'am, am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. Here uh, we have another question by Shiva Sangari SK. Her question is, which practitioners of cultural analysis do you particularly admire and why? Of course, I enjoyed, I know, Stuart a lot. Uh, 
uh, if you have to talk about writers, because I'm generally a person who reads and understands things, uh, I enjoyed Anuradha Ramanan's way of, uh, you know, going about things because she's very progressive. We have a right to do things as we like, as far as it doesn't hurt anybody else's sentiments. That is why I used her as an example in my presentation. She's also a writer. You must have understood from my presentation. <laughs> Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And we have another question by Sneha Lewis. Her question is, can a researcher study a culture without being a part of it, but by reading the primary text intensively? Will an outsider's perspective be seen as an imitation in the study? I mean, yes, limitation in the study. You can do research. Now, that's what we do as English literature students. Most of our books are on British literature and American literature, isn't it? A common British... Britisher may not know as much as a literature student knows. So you are doing it all the time. But then uh, you must understand that just reading the primary text wouldn't be enough. You must read a lot of secondary textbooks. You must watch a lot of movies. You must talk to a lot of people who live in that culture. Only then your research becomes original and it becomes authoritative. Otherwise, what if you have read only a few textbooks and they don't give you the true picture? Ma'am, I have a question, ma'am. Uh, yes. I'm Abhirami. And yes. uh, my question is related to counterculture and cyberculture. Counterculture and so, cyberculture. Is there yes. any relation with this uh, culture studies? Is counterculture and cyberculture has any relation with this culture studies? Yes. There is a new, I think even in your Calicut University syllabus, there are one or two essays on cyber security. Uh, it is, of course, a recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, topic though. Uh, counterculture can come under, you know, youth subculture even. But uh, cyber culture is a major thing that is being uh, analyzed now, especially after security has become so difficult nowadays. So cyber culture, reading itself has changed. Now I have a library in my house, but my next generation will not have a library. They'll have just a laptop. Everything will be in Kindle. So I prefer... You know, reading it from a paper, but I don't think you're going to be like that anymore. So everything has become digital. Everything, everything has become cyber. That culture has its own importance now. It has positives and negatives, of course. There are separate books based on that, but I ha I'm not dealing with cyber culture, but it is part of cultural studies. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. We have uh, some questions on uh, YouTube. Uh, posted some someone has posted some questions like uh, Alfred Charlie. Uh, uh, it's uh, his question is should culture be preserved? And mm -hmm. one more question, ma'am. Uh, is uh, Anju Tyagi uh, has asked one question. Can we start uh, the I mean the culture studies by beginning Peter Barry's book? Beginning yes. Book? So I first answered Mr. Charlie's question. There is no harm in preserving culture. That is why I gave you the example of Velu Nachiar. Uh, there was a small recession in uh, following up culture in our place for some time. And later on, they realized, oh, this particular thing is very precious. I must read again. There was a lot of politics also involved, uh, perhaps. Yes, most of the concentration was on achievers who were men. So suddenly they realized, only education helped us realize that there was a queen like Velu Nachiar. She had done so much. So let us revive that story. And that is reviving history. Similarly, there's nothing wrong in, uh, you know, conserving culture or preserving culture as far as the good things are trying to be projected. Of course, we can always forget the bad ones or the bad things that are followed as part of culture. Uh, now, the next question was, The next question was, uh, can we use uh, the book, uh, Peter Barry's Beginning Theory as a beginner? That is just a beginner. You know, you can just get an idea about whether you want to go ahead or not. Like when you start your PhD, you have no idea unless you have read all the books of your author and you want very badly to analyze, for example, ecofeminism in uh, Fire on the Mountain. That way it's okay. But more than 50% take a new subject because they want to do anthropology, for example, anthropocentrism or something. to, And they plan to read the book only after they decide. So that way you're having a shot in the dark. 
you have to go analyze and then only find out. So Peter Barry is just for beginners to understand of the different kinds of theories. But later, if you're interested in cultural studies, you must go in deeper. Okay, so, so I think that most of the participants have uh, raised their questions and ma'am has uh, answered very well and cleared all their doubts and queries. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, all of you. Such a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Ma'am, one message from Anubama Roy. Okay. Okay. Last year, I attended your lecture on 20th century criticism in 7-day FTP. It was organized by Sankita Lakshman, ma'am. It was good. Ma'am, can we have your email ID in case if someone wants to contact you regarding any doubts? Okay, I shall give it to the organizers. You can, you can get it from them. Okay, sure. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Anupam Roy. So kind of you. Thank you for your kind words. Let us pray that research helps us to improve further and further. Thank you so much. So thank you, ma'am, for your valuable answering for all the questions what participants asked. So I invite uh, Ashudi, ma'am, the professor, English department, to render the vote of thanks, ma'am, please. Thank you, Abhirami. First of all, let me uh, thank our respectable hon honorable chief guest, Dr. Nila, assistant professor, Mercy College. And ma'am, we are uh, so thankful and we are so honored to be with you in this occasion and uh, your uh, speech and your lecture was indeed very wonderful and you cleared all the doubts and all it was indeed a very interesting session and all and next i uh, would like to thank our respected principal dr rajesh sir uh, who was with us and who supported us guided us and uh, for the organization of this program uh, which had gone very well uh, with the participation of uh, all these uh, faculties and researchers from different parts of the world. And also I would thank uh, our respected HOD doc and IQAC coordinator, Dr. Nedila, Nedila T.Y. And uh, also all those who supported us like the staff coordinators like Dr. Sandor sir and PM Habib Rahman sir. And also the technical assistants and also my colleagues and my dear friends who supported us for organizing this wonderful event and made it a very successful one. And also, uh, last but not least, all the participants who participated in this uh, first day of this FTP program and wonderfully participated and also posted their questions and queries and all. So a very uh, thanking all of you, each and every one, for being a part of us in this wonderful session. Thank you all of you and have a nice day. Thank you, Nilama. Thank you so much to all the organizers, the participants. So happy to be with you today. God bless you all. Thank you, ma'am.